There we go. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mike Turner, and I'm a professor of music at the college here. And when I was approached about doing something about this movie, uh, I, of course, watched it, and I was immediately caught by uh, what the, the premise of the movie is, is about, which is transcribing music. So I thought I'd look into uh, and maybe share with you the concept of transcribing music, uh, give you a short history of musicological research, which has been involved with uh, music transcription. So, in music, transcription, transcription means notating a song or sound which was previously unnotated. For example, an improvised jazz solo might be something that uh, someone might transcribe. Uh, so they could play exactly the way it was played before. Uh, take a Louis Armstrong jazz solo and try to figure out what that was note for note so that you can play it. Uh, further examples of music transcription are included in ethno ethnomusicological research uh, in notation of folk songs. Uh, transcription of this nature involves scale degree recognition and harmonic analysis of which the transcriber will need good relative or perfect pitch to perform. It's also something that we teach students at the college level uh, how to be able to hear what they uh, see and see what they hear. In popular music, in rock, there are two forms of transcription. One might be an individual uh, performs copy and note, note for note guitar solo, for example. Another involves most rock bands, most pop bands, they don't read music. And so in order for a publisher to uh, publish their music, somebody has to note that, notate that music in a form that uh, a musician can read. So much of the music that you buy in the store of popular songs has been transcribed from the recording. Uh-oh, what did I do? There we go. Musicology is a scholarly an an analysis and research-based study of music. Uh, it's part of the humanities, and a scholar who participates in musical research is called a musicologist. Traditional hi historical musicology, or music history, uh, has been the most prominent subdiscipline of musicology. I already mentioned ethnomusicology is the study of music in its cultural context. It's only recently been considered a sub-genre uh, of musicology. So, going back in history, historically, these were the initial tools that were used for transcribing music. Music that was passed down from gener generation to generation in what we call the oral tradition, passing it out, passing it down by word of mouth, passing it down by singing a song and, uh, and having your children or other people learn those songs by rote. There were composers, as you might imagine, all along who also transcribed music. One of those was Johann Sebastian Bach. He often improvised his music in church uh, on his keyboard, the organ, or uh, clavichord, whichever instrument he might be playing, and he would improvise it for the church service, and then later, when he went home, he'd write it down. Well, that's ultimately music transcription. Bach is the most prolific composer that ever lived. Most of his music was done that way, where he played it first, and then he later wrote it down. So you can imagine how much music uh, he produced simply by transcribing what he had already played. In fact, he had over 600 works that we know of, and we're still finding music of Bach's in basements and places uh, in Europe. Mozart, maybe, there it goes. Uh, like Bach, Mozart had the ability to improvise something and later write it down. He also displayed his trans transcription abilities at a very young age. I have a little story there. As a child, his father went all over Europe showing off his genius ch uh, children, actually, uh, both um, 
Wolfgang and his sister Nenerl, uh, to royalty and the Pope. Rumor has it that after one of his trips to Rome to meet the Pope, young Mozart, who was probably six or seven at the time, sat down in the room in a tavern on their way home and wrote out the entire Mass he had just heard uh, at St. Peter's Basilica. His father was so overjoyed at his prowess that he showed off copies of it to uh, anyone who would listen, and the word got back to the Pope. The Pope had them immediately, had them immediately recalled back to uh, Rome to find out how Mozart had stolen the music of his mass from the Vatican. So that is a prime example of uh, music transcription. Beethoven, of course, uh, in his, uh, the, uh, is the ultimate transcriber in the sense that in his later years he was completely deaf. And so all the music that he wrote he had never heard and only had in his head. So uh, he's transcribing what he knew would be the correct sounds uh, without ever really hearing them. Although there were, he made attempts. There are also stories about him making attempts by cutting the legs off of his piano and setting it down on the floor and then laying on the floor and playing notes uh, so that he, and putting his ear down to the floor so he could hear the, the notes that he was playing. But most of it was done in his head first. He did. He was also a teacher of composition and insisted that his students uh, study music by writing down mu uh, music of other composers. So he also insisted on that from his young composers, his young students. There's also some famous composers who were also musicologists. They did research into the music of indigenous people, usually people of their own countries. Some of those were Dvorak. Now Dvorak actually was from uh, Europe, but he came to America to discover American music and, he, and engage in it. Uh, so he ended up uh, listening to folk music and writing it down and ended up using it in some of his compositions while he was here. So he was a transcriber and a musicologist uh, and also, of course, you know, a composer. His Symphony of the New World uh, had melodies in it from his own country, but also some things in it from this country. Uh, he supported the concept uh, that African American and Native American music should be used as a foundation for the growth of American music, which of course happened in jazz. So, uh, except for the um, Native American, the African American was used uh, in, con in conjunction with European music to, to come up with jazz. Um, he felt that uh, Americans could come up with their own traditional style of music, and of course that did happen with jazz. Bela Bartok is considered one of the most important composers of the 20th century. He and Liszt are regarded as Hungary's greatest composers. Through his collection and analytical study of folk music, he was one of the founders of comparative musicology, which later became known as ethnomusicology. Ralph Vaughan Williams, uh, an English composer, uh, transcribed a, a much of uh, English folk music. Uh, in fact, he's uh, incredited for, what does it say here, uh, 300 compositions, 800 compositions. Uh, collected over 800 songs as well as one, some singing song, singing games and dance tunes. For 10 years, he devoted up to 30 days a year to collecting folk music from singers in 21 English counties. So. He, uh, he, he did a lot of research into English folk songs. Uh, he was also uh, the uh, pre president, what does it say down here at the bottom, um, a member of the Society's Committee from 1904 to 46, and in that year the Society amalgamated with English Folk Dance Society, became the president of the English Folk Dance and Song Society, a position he held until he died. Oliver Messian is one of the, one of the strange ones that uh, people encounter in terms of this. He liked birds, and he ended up transcribing bird songs. Uh, and he ended up using that music and those bird songs in his own music. So he actually took, took it one step further and didn't just do music of people, but also of birds and used that music then uh, in his own compositions. All of this required... Uh, the ability to write the music uh, at that, as you heard it. 
as you might imagine, became a little bit easier with the advent of sound recording. Sound recording has uh, progressed in ways driven by the invention and commercial introduction of new technologies. There are four eras in sound recording. <coughs> the acoustic era, 1877 to 1925, is one of those. What you see here is an Edison home phonograph for recording and playing brown wax cylinders. This is the, uh, similar to the one that's going to be in the movie today. You'll notice that right there is a round cylinder. At the bottom of this megaphone, there is a needle that vibrates when someone sings or plays an instrument into this horn. It vibrates the whole horn and it all comes right down in here to a needle that's underneath, you can't see it, that's actually pressed against that uh, drum right there and it will record, it'll actually put the sound waves onto that drum and then all you have to do is just play it back and you can hear what was uh, what was recorded. This was fascinating at first for people to see this. In fact, it was used by many researchers to record uh, Native American songs as well as others, as we'll see in the movie today. Native American songs, many were preserved for future generations using this technology. <coughs> the phonograph disc record player worked on the same concept of the, as the drums, only it went down to a disc. As you can see, there's a disc there and there's a needle at the end of that long megaphone and it would, it would put the sound waves onto that disc and then you could play it back. Electrical disc recording came next in the electrical era from 1925 to 1945. Uh, this included being able to put sound on film as well. So this was the, the time frame between the, the, in that 20 years that they could take electrical recordings, as you can see in this case, taking the sound and manipulating it here, turning up volumes and doing other things until it eventually gets over there on a disc. So that was, that was the technology uh, that was introduced during this time frame of 25 to 45. The magnetic era came about from 45 to 75. This is an example of a reel-to-reel -reel recorder whereby the sound was recorded on reels of tape right here. That's, uh, again, using the sound waves and putting it down. This made it m much more possible to be able to do longer recordings of things because it was, you could get a lot more on the reel. Right after that, the cassette recorder came about uh, also in this time frame of 45 to 75 and you're able to do it's a mini tape on a cassette as you can see right there that ended up going in the top here and was recorded using microphones that were plugged into the machine. Finally the digital era which we're in now, uh, now it takes sound and, and converts it into digital information and then stores that uh, in a mini computer, so to speak, and allows that, that information then to be played back by converting the digital information back to acoustic information for uh, playback. So that's a short history, very limited history, of music transcription and the ability to uh, take music and put it into a listening form and, and or a playable form. Thank you very much.